for. All right, now we're officially recording. And let's see, we're going to do your spotlight at all. See, it doesn't. I tried to spotlight both of us, but I didn't. I don't know. That I, I see it that way. It looks like it's that working. to me. I can't see. Yeah, I just see everybody now. now. You can. I see just you and I big, and then I see everyone tiny at the top. But I'm also curious. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then we'll just leave it. I see like everybody's, but maybe it's um my view and it's showing people that don't have video hide non video. Maybe it fixes yeah. it. I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brianne Rosner. I'm the director of Snag. I am so um, delighted to have this Zoom with Kelly Jean Conroy, who has so generously um, created this amazing, one-of-a-kind, exclusive necklace for our raffle fundraiser. She is wearing it. She's going to model it for us. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm going to put a link um, to the raffle page in the chat. Um, and I'll share my screen too. Actually, I'll go ahead and share my screen now with that so we can all just take a look and maybe you can just talk a little bit about um, about the piece as we jump in. And I'll show you while, while we're here, let me show you how you can purchase raffle tickets. <laughs> you just put your details right in here. Um, you pick your tickets, you'll hit, hit um, enter details. It'll keep prompting you to the next window until you have completed um, your purchase. So we hope you will um, get the raffle tickets. It is uh, closes on July 12th. You get a free ticket if you get a bundle, but you can also just do them multiples. Um, you can also do multiple bundles. We have had that for several of our raffles. So thank you to all of those people that have um, purchased multiple bundles. And um, and here we are. So here is this beautiful necklace. And do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, I mean, it is uh, lapis. So it's lapis lazuli, lazuli. It is real stone. There is oftentimes I'll use recon stone in my work, which is reconstituted stone. Um, but this is actually real uh, re uh, lapis. And um, it's double sided in case it flips. Um, as I was getting ready for the mad show, I was buying cabochons of this and bezeling them. And then I was realizing this is so much work to make bezels for each stone. I need to think about some beads instead. So then if they flip, they could be double-sided, have different pictures. Maybe there's a surprise on the back. So I had a lot of fun making this for snag. It was like an honor to make it for snag. Snag's super important to me. So um, I'm thankful to be able to do such a thing for snag and help this organization. But yeah, I have, uh, so the story about the lap is I was toiling away at getting ready for the show and I'll show you my setup for my laser. Hopefully you don't get dizzy from my walking, but uh, my laser's right here. And I had all my lapis, these like big chunks of like, here's my lapis stash. It's all on the floor. Sorry about this, <laughs> but all this, all the floor. And I was like, these are so fun and they etch so well, but they have to be in silver. And then my best friend who's in this zoom, hi Monica, she was shopping at Tucson. She's like, let's look for some beads. So she FaceTimed me from Tucson, which was like the biggest gift ever. And she found a whole bunch of beautiful lapis beads. So this is one of those strands that she brought back with her from Tucson and shipped all the way from LA, which probably came all the way from Afghanistan. Um, so thank you, Monica. But yeah. Wait, I'll come. Uh, I know I move location. I'll say that's all right. Sorry. <laughs> Um, zones yeah, in the studio, in the of your studio, but um, our communications coordinator Rebecca has put together some questions, which is awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so we can learn a little bit more about you and your journey, and then talk more about your work and process, maybe or sure. something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, do you want to tell us about how you got your start? as a metalsmith and how does your background in painting inform your jewelry? Sure. I mean, um, you know, as a kid and you go to class and art, you think that artists are painters, right? It's kind of how we all, I feel like we all start that way. And then we discover metalsmithing and we're like, oh. Um, so I had that typical journey as everyone else probably did. Uh, I took my first class at Syracuse and I loved it so much. And I realized, oh, I could make miniature 
paintings to wear on the neck. So I started with enameline. That was my gateway drug. So I did a lot of enameline as soon as I graduated from Syracuse. And I realized I need to learn as much as I can because I had an art ed degree. So I was working as an art teacher, like a general ed art teacher. And I was sort of self-teaching myself how to be a metalsmith, quote unquote. And then I thought the best path for that was to go to graduate school, um, which in hindsight taught me nothing about being a metalsmith, but everything about how to think, I think. Uh, so it was super valuable, but also super self-conscious because I wasn't a true metalsmith at that point. I was a painter with an art ed degree going to school for graduate school for metalsmithing. So my path was sort of winding. I, you know, took five years off between undergrad and grad. And I think that was the right journey because I think I ended up in just the right spot um, because I now am working as an art teacher, but also specifically only metalsmithing is what I teach. So I have my dream job. We're using both degrees. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so all my free time, I spend my time making jewelry myself. And the painting aspect, I feel like it comes through with like my imagery, right? Like when I enamel, I'm always drawing something or painting something or glazing something with watercolor glazes. And when I am etching or doing things, I'm drawing in my sketchbook or looking through books of all my favorite treasures and birds and shells and rocks, and then taking those drawings and etching them into the computer, the computer system to laser it. So um, it's all there, the color, the imagery, the same what my paintings look like, but these are more fun to do now. Yeah, I get it. I, it's funny too, because I have a degree in painting and I've like made my way and I kind of combine them. And um, the other um, artists that we had for this raffle series that had a piece of work was um, Jamie Bennett. And he also, right, does all the painting. And so it's, um, it's interesting that it keeps coming up. So that's yeah. really, really cool. If we um, think about all of us, like in the metalsmithing field, we probably all at some point did some painting and felt strongly about it to continue, you know? So it makes sense, especially for your work actually with the canvases and the, yeah. I love what you do. So, so do you wanna talk um, any more about your teaching since you were brought that up and um, any experiences with students that have impacted how you approach your work? I mean, that's a, it's so I could talk forever about that probably, but um, to keep it simple, I think uh, a lot of people are like, how do you have time at the end of the day? You know, it's like, I feel like teaching really like inspires me for my own practice and like the kids in my classroom, like I teach high school and I think my kids are just amazing. And I joke that I would do it for free. And I kind of think I would do it for free. I really think beginners are my wheelhouse. Like I love seeing them discover the magic of like getting the solder seam all the way. Like, you know, our final project we just finished because I finished teaching last week was to do a bezel setting. And um, it's just so rewarding because I remember my first bezel setting and I still have it from Syracuse, this crappy turquoise that I cracked because I threw it in the tumbler, which you shouldn't do and um, stained the stone, <laughs> but I still wear it and I'm still quite proud of it. So to see my students doing that still gives me like the ultimate joy. And so it just like the questions they have and the things they come up with because they don't have any like self-consciousness, like they don't know they can't do something. So they just try it and I tell them to try it. So they sort of inspire me with what they're able to like come up with sometimes in their own project ideas. Like I give them so much freedom in the classroom. So I think, you know, it's, I am perfect for teaching that level. Like, and I also think like when I was at Mass Art and when I teach at Metalworks, I love the beginners because they don't, they're just, there's no different than a kid, right? Like you're new and you're unsure about yourself. And so to be able to foster and help them along the way and like discover the magic of making jewelry. Cause I, most people are like, I've always wanted to know how to do this, you know? So. Um, and you teach workshops too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Metal works. And I have one at Pocosin coming up on the laser cutters. So if anyone's really curious with the laser, um, I believe it's a, a virtual for Pocosin and then maybe next June it's going to be in person for five days, which I'm very excited about because I've never taught there before, but Metalworks is like my second home. I'm always, I love, love everyone there. Um, and I do want to say to everybody out there, um, <laughs> if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We can, or you can even come on and ask your questions, but this isn't meant to be interactive. So we will. Yes. Just ask your questions at any time. Um, so please, please, please. It's, yes, please. <laughs> are you having your questions better than me having asked all the questions? Um, I'm like banking on all of you having really fun, good questions and want to know all the juicy gossip or ask about my dead birds and my freezer and all that stuff. 
You want to talk about your dead birds in your freezer? <laughs> I have a really, really sweet dead bunny in my freezer right now. And I don't like, it's gotta be something. I, there was a nest in my backyard and it, they were so sweet. And every day I went out and looked, checked on them. Oh, and then one, I found one in the middle of the yard and I had to go in my freezer and it's so small and it will be a necklace and it will be made into art and it will be a thing of beauty someday. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people will see my work cause they'll, you know, somehow see me somewhere and they'll Google the pictures and they'll say, Oh my God. And either you get it or you don't. And sometimes I've had people say to me in a workshop, like, Oh, I thought you were going to be like super morbid or really goth. Um, it's really not what it's about. It's like, I mean, I've talked about my work in a way, like when I was a little kid, I would go play in the woods and I would find creatures and I would bury them if they were dead and I would paint their headstones. And so like, I just see this as a grown up version of me playing in playing, but also now knowing what death means. And it's sort of like a way of honoring the creature and the cycle of life. And, um, I don't think it's, it's, it's sad, but I think it's like a quiet beauty. So that's how I think of my conceptual work. Um, but also I think what's nice about doing the conceptual work when I have time for it is it informs the studio practice with the laser etching and all the fun gems and the sawing pearl and all that good stuff too. So it's good to have a hand in all of it. If you can um, find time for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got a question. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, how did you get into dead things in taxidermy? Yeah. So yeah, for like, I literally have this like really formative memory of being at this little cottage in upstate New York, um, Tully, New York, and there was a dead squished turtle on the road. And I remember just being like gobsmacked by it and like being like, but why, but why is it, you know, like just not understanding. And I was so little, but like, I don't have many memories, but I remember that. And I remember also like finding some caterpillars and bringing it to the neighbor to show her this like older woman who lived next door. And she took the caterpillar in my hands and she put it on the ground and she smushed it. And like, that is a memory that stuck with me because it was a gypsy moth and they're like bad moths to have around. And I was too excited about the caterpillar. But anyways, like, so these like images of me as a child and like discovering what death is and learning what death is and starting to understand, oh, things don't live forever. And then like realizing that translates to people. It's sort of like the dead animals are, you know, they're stand-ins for real people that I might know and source like a way so the dead creatures and it's also a way of like sometimes you want to look at the bird but you can't see the bird because it's flying around but if it's dead you can actually look up really close and see like oh look at how its toenail curls and that one goes the other way and you can see the colors of the feathers so much more like I just found a blue jay when I was driving and I pulled over because of course I have gloves and bags in my car and um uh, and I could just like the, like, and I've never had a dead blue jay before of all the time I've been working with dead birds. And I just couldn't believe how beautiful this creature is. And it's so taken for granted. They're everywhere. We hear them all the time and we see them all the time, but like to look at it up close, there's a magic in this. Like, so there's that. And there, I don't know, there's a couple layers to it. It's just like the soothing of loss and like anticipatory loss, like, oh, someone I love could die. And, and so it's me soothing myself and trying to think about loss and then also like confronting it and trying to make it beautiful. And then also, trying to show it's a cycle of life and all of, all of the things that a circle necklace can do. But yeah, I, I can't get away from it. I tried every single way of making, like, I have, this is hilarious. These are my, I was in graduate school and I was like, I want to do work about dead birds. So I like made a dead bird bezel and filled it with like flower drawings, like layered flower drawings. And my professor was like, nah, not it yet. Not there. And then I was like, I'll make a bird in wax and I will electroform it and then I will enamel and make a dead bird he's like no <laughs> so I tried really hard to not use the real thing and I think once I used the real thing in graduate school he was like you've done it so um you know that's what graduate school does for you and I thought I was going to go to grad school and make beautiful flower collars and be fun and bright and pretty but that's not what happens in grad school <laughs> um so yeah did you like teach yourself or you like learned how to do the taxidermy part of it oh well I mean I don't I the first one I had taxidermy but then I had to get a permit because songbirds are technically illegal to have in your possession so you're not even supposed to have a nest or a feather like I'm not supposed to have any of these creatures so obviously they're not for sale um but it's there's a songbird protection act so you can't even have feathers in your home but um the first one I got a permit for I had was a dead cardinal and I got a permit for her and 
as an educational institution and had her taxidermy, although the guy couldn't taxidermy it, so he just basically tanned it. And so I researched like how do people preserve animals and the Native Americans used cornmeal. So that's how I preserved the birds and the cornmeal just sort of like, not to be gross, but just sort of sucks the liquids out and they just sort of become a little bit flat and then they're like little, little sleeping beauties and they don't smell and then they can become a gemstone that I'll prong scent in a cast twig. Um, so yeah, so I don't taxidermy. I don't think I could, I've watched taxidermy videos. I don't think I could do it. I don't think you could pay me enough money to taxidermy, honestly, so. Did, did my hum, Hummer to you and all the cornmeal, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my friend Allison found a um, bird and she sent it to me in cornmeal. She's a very good friend. Um, <laughs> I get a lot of pictures on my phone, text messages of dead birds and people being like, do you want this one? It's like the number one image that I just get texted. <laughs> um, and it's funny because I don't do too much dead bird pieces anymore, but I just did make one for a show at Monique Rancourt's gallery. So I just did revisit the work and it felt really nice to do so, but I don't do that stuff very much anymore. But I, you see my, I do love taxidermy. So we have a question. How did your work morph from dead things to laser etching stones? How did you get into the laser etching process? That's a really good question. Cause it is sort of seen like a jump. <laughs> and I was joking with Brianne that, you know, um, I recently was diagnosed with ADHD with ADHD at 39. And of course that totally makes sense. And just seeing like how I've laid out my studio where like, this is my laser area. That's my enamel area. That's my metal smithing area. And, um, I like all the things and I want to do all the things I, the, the laser came into my work at Haystack and Haystack is a place that if you don't know is magical, a magical place on earth for anyone to go. Even if there's non-metalsmiths in this room, you should all look at Haystack to go. Uh, it says like a summer camp for adults in Maine. And, um, I went in 2015 and they have a fab lab on the property. And I went every single day. Cause I was very curious about how the laser, the drawings, or images like what I did was I picked buttercups around the property and I scanned the buttercups because I'm really interested in like placing things to where I am, scanned the buttercups and then had an image and then printed them on the enamel to see if it would burn the enamel. enamel. And actually what it does is fuses the enamel at like 2000 degrees. So it like blackens the color of the enamel. And so that's just sort of sparked my journey. Like, oh my gosh, I can like put my drawings on things. And then I was like, what else can I put it on? So like, here's my table of things. So you can see the madness of my collections and like, I'm going to try mica. I have a little chunk of mica somewhere that I just found that I got in Maine. And I'm going to, um, I know it works on mica. I know it works on pearl, black mother pearl. And it's just a learning curve, right? Like, so I was just like, what else can I put on the laser? So this is like a little piece of cal. This is quartz, dyed quartz, and it works on the quartz doesn't work on Chalcedony. And it really like, I'll sit here for hours, just like fiddling with the settings because it's, that's what the time is for this. Like, so my test for the lapis, it's like, this is a small test of me trying to get the circles to show up just right. And also like just a plain circle, then I'll do a floral. Um, and then the lapis is annoying at some points too, because lapis often has um, pyrite inclusions. So fool's gold will be inside the blue. And then if it hits the pyrite, it won't give you a line. So which again, it can be cool, can also be annoying if you're trying to make a really crisp image. So like, there's just a learning curve for each stone. But yeah, it just sort of, to me, it seems very natural <laughs> how it all moved. I'm like, oh, I'll put dead, dead bird images on gemstones. Like it all goes together. Um, but yeah, it does seem like a jump, but, and I think it's also really nice as an artist to like have different veins in which you work and you can always revisit them. Like I saw this really great talk. It was Lauren Common and she talked about how her work goes like this. And there's like a, uh, like a, I don't remember exact word, but this was the image she did with her hand. And I was like, that makes so much sense. Like you can go to things and then come back to things and then that's okay. Right. Yeah. I always say like with my work, right. It's like this series of aha moments because like you're saying, like you kind of build all these different bodies of work or techniques and then like as you build them you'll start to make different connections that maybe you wouldn't have made those like 10 years ago right and so right. they're always just kind of all in there I mean the very it's to, to to like as I'm thinking right now the way I could boil it down very easily is I made this final piece for graduate school in 2013 I can't believe it's been 10 years but it was a piece with a dead bird and then a dead bird skeleton. And then there's all this mother of pearl along the top that I hand pierced the ovals. And then I hand pierced 
forget-me-nots from Tully, that place in New York. And I hand pierced each of those out and they were a nightmare because Mother of Pearl is very fragile and it will shatter. And it looks so good and I loved it so much. And people were like, oh my God, it's the pearl parts, the pearl parts. And um, if you see this is a piece on my website, it's one of my favorite pieces I've ever made. And then I was like, I really think the pearl is something people are being drawn to. And then it worked really well as a production piece and people wanted to buy it. I, I made a bunch of pieces for snag. I did the trunk show at Boston snag. And I just did mother pearl and I hand sawed each one. And I, I sold out of all of them. Like everyone bought those little funny, cute flower weed mother pearl pieces. And so that's where the laser started. I was like, oh, I can take a real image and put it on the pearl. And then it's not cut through all the way. I tried to cut through all the way, but the pearl doesn't want to cut through all the way, at least on my laser. Apparently there's a laser that costs 40 grand that will cut through the pearl. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, it's funny because if I show someone who's not even a metalsmith, do you like the cut one or do you like the laser etched one? Most people prefer the cut one, but it's just so labor intensive and not so dangerous. I mean, not so good to breathe the dust when you're sawing the pearl. Um, so that became a, just a quicker, more efficient way for me to have production work. So that's the truth of the laser also. We have another question from the audience. Um, good. Keep them coming. These are good. And also I would love if people popped in and asked their questions in real life. Yeah. Do you want somebody <laughs> want to ask a question justice? I want justice too, if you would. <laughs> I don't know. How, um, how does the hands and their positions in your lapis necklace contribute to the cycle? And what does it represent? That's a great question. Let's see. So I, when I, so my hands, I, here's a little test tile of all my hands that I, that I have in my sketchbook that I've translated into um, vector drawings so I could laser etch them. And so those are the pieces I'm working with. And all of the pieces I feel like show tenderness and show care, the gestures of the hand. Um, so sometimes I'll have pieces where the hands are interacting, like they're almost touching or the ones reaching for the other one. Um, so the pieces in this piece sort of just are just a collage of that, really. I didn't think too much about it. I work sort of like intuitively as I go. And I'll, I always sort of infuse a little flower or a little branch with berries. So in the front ones, I made the one reaching for the other hand and the hands were turned away. So I kind of just, I work just like change the angle. Do I want it to be the thumb to be facing this way? And there's a lot you can say and a lot you can interpret from how you create and juxtapose imagery. So just, you know, as makers, I think a lot about hands. Uh, and if I didn't have my hands and how it's my most crucial tool, honestly, like I think I could do without most but you need your hands. And I always find that when I am around other metalsmiths, they always love my hand pieces the most. And I think that's because we all know the value in this object. And then also the fact that we, this is what we use to take care of things and to, yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Follow up question. If anybody, please, you can come on and ask your question. Yeah. Um, oh, here we go. Can you tell us more about your process? Do you wax cast anything? Wax cast? Um, let's go on. I don't have to figure out the, the chats there. Um, my process. So um, the piece that I just did for Monique, which was just recently I put on my Instagram, that was all waxed. Um, I actually didn't use wax. They were all direct castings from real twigs in my from my backyard. So um, they were cast in sterling silver. And I use those as my like prong settings. Um, I will do wax at times if I want to make my own flowers I'll use the modeling wax and build them and sometimes I will use like the silk flowers from the craft store and I'll I'll paint wax on the back of them to thicken them up so I can cast those if I'm looking for that um I do really really love casting I haven't been doing too too much of it um but I like that too I like it all <laughs> okay so Question from, from Effie. I know nothing about lasers. Can you give a very simple explanation of drawing to laser etching? Totally. Yeah. I teach, when I teach laser, what I do with laser, I teach it in the most like simple way because I use it in a very simple way. Like I use like laser, laser etching for dummies, honestly. Um, I will, I will even like draw a shape. I'll be like, okay, what shape do we want to cut out? I'll draw like a clover and I'll be like, here's our shape. And then I'll take a picture with my iPhone 
And then I will take that picture of my iPhone and put it into the interface for my machine. And it will realize like, oh, here's a, a line you drew. Do we want to just mark it? And it will mark it like this. It'll like an inkjet printer will go boop, boop, boop. And it'll make marks at where it's hitting the line, just like an inkjet printer would. Or it'll say, do you want to cut it? And if you want to cut it, it's going to go like this, boop, 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 boop. And the machine just knows to do that based on the settings I put in. And the settings is where the, if I knew how to switch my screen, I could show you, but it's very simple. And it's just a matter of like, is that shape I just drew going to go all the way through the material or just going to make a mark on the surface? And then if the mark's not dark enough, then I will up the power. Or if I'm like, oh, the power's not working, then I'll slow down the speed. So you have the speed and power to deal with when you are laser etching or laser cutting. So those are the two numbers that I mostly deal with. There's another number called a PPI, which is like DPI, like how many dots per blah, 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 more stuff. But I keep it as simple as possible. Yeah, it's called PPI in my machine. But I also learned at MassArt when I was teaching there. I taught at MassArt for five or six years till the pandemic started. And they had like a big universal expensive machine and I had to do it all very like traditionally like in illustrator and vectorize it this machine's much more simple and user-friendly I have a glowforge it's almost like silly easy honestly compared to what I learned on um but yeah I, I do it as simple as possible if I have an image like I went on a run and I found a dead snake and I carried it home with me um <laughs> the cars that might drive by me sometimes and I got home and I held it up by its tail and I took a photo of it. And then if I have a photo of it, a JPEG of the snake, I can then just clear out the background with my iPad. I just use um, my favorite app is Procreate and I will just erase the background. So I have just the snake and then I can take that snake image and put it on anything. And I use that snake a lot. And then, then it's there, right? And then I can scale it up big or small. I can like arrange it with other things on top of it or make the snake look like flowers are coming off the tail. Um, so that's the other thing I think about the laser is so nice. So once I have the image and I've done the work on the, the um, file, it's just saved for me and I can use it, pull it whenever I want. So it's very, very simple. And I'm happy to do a more in-depth show and tell anytime for you, Effie. <laughs> and she asked also about the size of the drawing. Like, do you yeah. worry about that? So what's nice about this laser, I'll pop, pop it up. So my, so it, at MassArt, it had no camera. So if I put a tiny, I would put things like this size at MassArt. I look like a crazy person, my little jeweler stuff. So I'd have like a pearl and I put the pearl in and then I'd have to place the laser. So I'd have to fiddle around till I got the red beam to shoot on my pearl. I'm like, okay, I'm in the right spot. This, I have a camera. So it shows me what the bed looks like. So then I'll take my snake and I'll drag it over and then I'll just scale it down, just like pull it's the corners scale. in. And I'm like, okay, the snake is now on the pearl. I know that's gonna print on the pearl. And then I just like push this glowing button, it glows, Glowforge. And it will glow and I'll push it and then it will print on the snake. And it usually takes a minute for my tiny little things. It's so satisfying to <laughs> have it be so simple and fun. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I try to be very organized with like how I set up my studio and like, all my settings are saved in the database, but I have all my drawers with like all my bits and bobs, like the acrylic, like I'll find acrylic from all these like random and then I'll hoard them as we all do. We hoard our materials, but here's my mother pearl drawer. If you guys want to see that, I don't know if this is fun for people. Studio tour, like this, this is a crazy long drawer. Look at this, um, but all the different shapes I have and then the black mother pearl, black onyx. And of course I, keep hoarding. Um, but yeah, so you'll see, like I have a bunch of notebooks and I just like write down all my numbers and my speeds and my, my speed and my power for every single material I play with. So, but the size is fairly easy to just navigate with the camera. Monica would love a studio tour, but I know you're on a laptop. So I don't I know. know. Uh, I was like, I wonder if it's like easier if I did it on an iPad or a phone. Is it totally like make you um seasick if I walk around with it I mean I'm in my laser area right now so so there's my laser area I have all my like stuff I have my um drawers and my materials there's my lapis area <laughs> um all my old parts and bits things that people are always giving me things this is where I keep all my treasures from like people giving me like my friend just gave me this really cool skull of some seabird. Um, Jennifer asked where you buy your mother of pearl from. Oh, many places. Um, there's this really awesome place. I don't know if any of you are local, but this place in Providence called Wolfie Myro. And it's like a closeout for jewelry supplies. And I just like go there and 
troll through their like buckets of pearl and you have to buy like 50 pounds of things and it's super fun. Um, I did buy all their ovals, so I need to find a new supplier. Uh, but I've got a tip in New York City that I guess there's a spot I can check out. Um, but sometimes I'll buy sheet mother pearl because sometimes I like to make my own shapes. Like I just was doing these fun little banana brooches in the yellow mother pearl. And so then I want to have my own shape. And, and the laser won't cut through it, obviously. So I will cut out the banana and then I will finish by hand sawing the, the outline. Um, but the mother pearl, there's a couple different like wholesale, you know, the companies that do a lot of the luthier, like, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that quite right, but like the people who do like those beautiful guitar, um, I don't even know what it's called. Someone, I don't know, someone in here plays guitar, um, the, where they do the inlay and the guitar. So that those suppliers, the same sort of artists, then they'll laser cut. Like I saw this guy at a craft show and he's like, oh yeah, I laser cut. And he did just beautiful, like wooden backdrops with pearl inlaid and stone inlay. Um, abalone shell. So those type of luthier suppliers are usually really good ones for pearl and eBay too. I started on eBay, but I found some places better than eBay for like the shell sheet. And also you could do it yourself, buy a big shell, put a respirator on and grind your own sheet, <laughs> which seems fun, but I don't have time for that. So yeah, so that's my um, nature treasure area. And then, sorry, I'm trying not to make you guys dizzy. There's where I lay everything out. Like I'm getting ready to send some stuff out to some galleries. It's my layout table and my bookshelf with all my handouts. I love a handout. Um, I have a sink up here, which is so lucky. I love also that um, on the Instagram, the picture of that you posted of my studio was my old basement studio. And I was like, oh my God, it was so efficient. It was just everything, one chair in the middle and everything was in the spot. But now I moved and now I have this big view. I'm in the country now. I was in Boston and I just have this big, beautiful, bright, happy studio. So I have a little sink up here. And then I have all my like grinding, messy, wet stuff. And then this is my um, metal smithing area where I will do my bench work and my soldering. Oh, and that's my enameling area, which I'm quite proud of my um, sample board. But I'll be honest, I don't spend much time over here lately, but it's very organized. And I have a ton of Japanese purples, color enamels. But yeah, so this is my bench. This is where usually I'm sitting and working and I cleaned it up for you guys. So you can see all my, there's Monica, who my lapis buyer, but um, yeah, so this is my bench and I have ventilation. That's very important. I wish I had something more fancy than this, but it's, I have to say it's pretty awesome. And it also is wonderful because when I'm sawing the pearl, I put it right here and then I don't have to breathe as much of it, but I do also safety wear my respirator when I'm doing the pearl. But yeah, those are my three zones of the studio. Um, Hopefully that's good. Any more questions of the studio? I'm happy to talk about my studio. I love my studio. <laughs> questions, questions, people have questions. Oh, the dog portrait. Isn't that so beautiful? My friend Tammy made that. I went to graduate school with her. She's a, like a wizard with wire of a little French bulldog. We've got what's in the Hobbit door. Oh, that's a great question. Do you guys want to see my Hobbit door? <laughs> And can you write the name of the ventilation in your? Yes. Uh, yeah. Time? Yeah. And anything that I'm talking about, and I'm, I know I talk quickly, I'm happy to, you can text me or DM me and I'm happy to give you any information you want to know. Like I, as a teacher, I tell everybody everything and people are like, you can't give all your secrets away, but I will tell you anything you want to know where to get something. Just DM me. I'm just rather share the information. Knowledge is power. So the Hobbit door, sorry, I'm going to get you seasick. I know it's a jar too. You're probably like, Oh, something's down in there. That's where I keep all my shipping stuff. It's not that exciting, but it's a cute little like nice. all my boxes and all my, um, yeah, packing stuff. Not that exciting, but out of the way so you have to see it. Um, questions, do other people have questions? I, we have some, okay, we've got some, we didn't talk about these things. Like, can you share more about your signature technique and style? Oh, <laughs> you don't have, wait, so, we do have a question. You said that you moved the to sure technique. Where did, where did you move to? Oh, um, I am in Holliston, Massachusetts, which to be honest with you, I grew up in Massachusetts. I didn't even know where this place was. Um, it shows up as green space on a map. It's right below Framingham and Natick. It's like mostly like, honestly, the country, like the farmland, but it's been, it's great. Well, here's, here's a good question. Okay. What, what <laughs> is the process like when you begin work on a new piece? Hmm. That's a good one. I mean, we all 
hopefully have a lot of ideas in our brain and just not enough time to make everything. So to make a new piece, usually I have some sketches and it's been percolating, you know, those runs I go on definitely, I think up most of my ideas when I'm out running. Um, yeah, I just, I come in and I scribble it down and like the other day I was just had this idea and I was like, oh, what if I used, so I've, I've been on a little journey with the inlays I've been using and I bought this metallic ink, this like metallic gray sparkle ink. And I was like, what if I did one of my botanicals and did it with, you're not gonna be able to see it. The lighting's not super good, but it's like this like shimmery gray ink. So I'm kind of playing with that. And I just bought blue ink and I just finished a pair of coral earrings with blue, like navy blue. Just like right now, that's where I'm at. I'm having fun. Um, I just like, oh, I want to do a petal and I want to do a kestrel. And I was like, I'm going to do, I just finished these. I mean, I'm not finished with them. They're just stones. But the fun is just like getting the stones. And if then I'll make them, I'm like, oh, what if they're a necklace? And or what if I start making like a crazy stone necklace with all the different colors? And I don't know. I'm just having fun right now, to be honest with you, in the studio, because I finished that um, show for New York in April, the end of April. And that was a whole year's worth of work and thinking about. So it's nice to not have the pressure of a big show. It is nice to have a show, but it's also nice to not have it. If that makes sense. Like it's nice to just like have a good time and not worry about it. And the luxury of being a teacher is I don't have to make my work to live off of. And my work truly is a luxury to be able to make and have fun. And if I sell it, that's a bonus. And if I don't, I'm happy to wear everything I make. Cause I make it cause I want it, you know, like I want some black earrings that are in the shape of a petal. I think that'd be real cute. So I just need it. The other piece, there's like a piece that had um all the different fruit, right? The oh, yeah. That was so cool. I, I, I got to just... tell you before I get mad about jewelry. It was, it was such a treat. Um, yeah, that was a fun piece. I was just like a whim. I'm like, what if I just made fruit mother pearls and then made ants walking across them? That would be funny. And then I said, I made it and it sold because someone else thought it was funny. <laughs> We've got a slew of questions here. So Justin, I see your hand is raised. Do you want to ask your question? Yes. Hi, Kelly. Hey, hey Justin Brown. How are you? I was just wondering what classes are you teaching and where are you teaching next? Uh, well, good question. I'm going to be doing a Metalworks uh, laser class. It's going to be laser on enamel. So that's gonna, we've never done it before, but um, you know, I'm so, I'm so in love with Metalworks and they were in a pinch for an October weekend. And I was like, you know what? I'll work 15 days in a row. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll teach that class for you Saturday and Sunday. So I think it'll be a really good time. It's so different from the class, like the high school classroom that I love working with the adults. So that's my next one. That'll be in October. And then I'll be on a virtual class for Pocosin on laser. Just like, it, I'm not quite sure. It's just more like a show and tell the laser. I don't think people are going to make anything, which I wish they would, but it's hard to get access to a laser. And then um, I'll be at Pocosin hopefully next summer in June. Um, but yeah, I, I, I try to say yes to everything. Like I taught at Snow Farm last year. I did an enameling class, which was a blast. Um, it was a four day enameling course. I get tapped for enameling a lot, even though I don't do a lot of it in my work. Um, but I love to teach enameling. I think it's magical. So um, yeah. I'll teach you. Mm -hmm. If you have a place to teach, Justin, I'll come. You just invite me. And do you do virtual classes with Metalworks? I haven't yet. This Bacosin one will be my very first one ever. I'm. I don't. We'll see how it goes. I don't. I know. I've got. I've. I've been a participant. I love being a student. So I've been a participant in many virtual classes. So hopefully, I've retained some. Of about the yeah. yeah. Um, I have seen you in person schedules, yeah. classes, but Melworks, but never, I don't live there. I don't live in Massachusetts anymore, so I can't go to Melworks. So maybe a virtual enameling class. With and maybe um, Anastasia, if you're not familiar with Pocosin, they're in North Carolina, but they do a lot of virtual classes. I don't so know, just send that. me a link and maybe I'll just <laughs> yeah, reach out to me and I'll send you a bunch of uh, virtual. There's a lot of really great enameling classes happening. And I feel like that would work really well I, with your work. I took two, um, but they were um, torch fire enamels. And I can't do it right. <laughs> so I, maybe I need you, you know. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd love to have you as a student again. Thank you. Yeah. And I would love to have you as a teacher.
So we have another question. Um, do you add, do you have to add ink into the etched areas almost like scrimshaw when you're it depends on the material, like this lapis piece I'm wearing for, for you guys for snag. Um, this is just what the laser does. So it's just the remnants of the laser. So it just whitens, it leaves a white path. Um sometimes I put white in, like the black mother pearl I'll put white in, the black onyx I'll put white in. Um but not always. So that's a great question. Cause I'll do a lot of the turquoise. Sometimes I like what it looks like without anything in it, but then sometimes I'm like, Oh, it looks so good with the black. It looks so sharp and crisp. So it depends. Uh, I've been definitely playing with like different brand inks. I'm sort of having a moment right now. I'm like, Oh, this ink versus this ink. Oh. And then, um, the, that luthier company I was telling you guys about, or, or one of the companies they make like a crayon engraving filler. And this might be my new favorite of the moment. It's like a wax crayon. And then I'm like, what if a real Crayola crayon would be good? So that's the best part of being more experimental and having fun as I could just try whatever, where my, I might try crayons next. So we'll see. Um, and, and Wendy Jo asked, uh, what type of gas do you use in your studio? Oh yeah. I have an acetylene tank, um, down below. Yep, just plain old settling, just like Metalworks has. You know, Wendy chose a Metalworks girl. Um, I started with an MC tank because I was scared. Do you know the MC? It's like this cute little baby uh, acetylene tank. It was this big. I can hide it under my arm to get into the apartment because I used to rent. And um, eventually I was like, it's time to get a B tank. So <laughs> get the big, big girl tank. Um, let's see. We might have kind of got asked all these questions. Um, where can people find your work? Oh, here we go. Uh, yeah, studio is in yeah. your home. Yeah, so I'm above the garage right now. So that's why it's nice and big. My husband was like, that sh this should be our bedroom. It's the best room in the house. And I was like, I know. It's, just, it's the best room in the house. You are not wrong. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> well, I did that. Well, um, I don't have a whole, a whole family in my house. But I was like, master bedroom, that is my studio. So I've got yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, it's great. Um, okay, how did you how did uh you, you how did you first get your pieces into art galleries? That's a really good question. That's a tough one, um, right? Because like I think we all go to school and we don't get taught how to be a business person in for, as far as like how to make money on your work and how to approach galleries. I think that could be a super valuable uh you know professional development type of course that snag could offer i'm sure has well, offered <laughs> we have a workshop series coming up and i think seth is doing one i, I he, he's covering a lot of professional um awesome. we're about to that. launch all that so stay tuned in your email i saw that i will be there in attendance for many of them that looks so good um what was the question uh in my gallery so uh the galleries i feel like uh, thankfully like Instagram is the thing. Like I don't use Facebook much anymore. And Instagram is so visual that people have reached out to me through Instagram. So people find you if your aesthetic is the right fit for them. And then you reach out to you and you sort of trial it out. Like, so I'm at, um, pistachios in Chicago. Um, my longest gallery is the Worcester center for crafts, which is where I took my very first enameling course when I was age 22, fresh out of Syracuse. And I've had, so had my work there a very, very long time. Um, they don't sell too much of it, but it's still like a really special place to send them work. I mean, that place has been around for like 160 years, one of the first craft schools in the country. Um, but yeah, I'm also at Equinox, which is in San Antonio and Monique here in Waltham. Um, a lot of times, like I don't have the ability to be in more places because I'm just me. And I, so I do the best I can um, with galleries, but, and also too, like galleries, like I had a gallery and they were like, Hey, we don't have room for you anymore. That happens, right? Like you could do, you could do great at the holiday season and then they don't have space for you and that happens too. And so it just sort of naturally comes and goes. And if it's the right fit, it's the right fit. And I've had people be like, we want to buy $1,500 worth of your pieces. And then they do that and then they sell it. And then maybe they don't place another order and that's okay. You weren't the right fit. So it depends I'm mostly these galleries that I'm saying right now are consignment galleries. So they work, like I send them the work and I get paid if it sells. So, um, the other ones, sometimes you get a wholesale, like they'll place an order for wholesale, which is always nice. Right. But again, I'm not a production jeweler. So that is hard for me to produce. Like since I was doing mad and putting all my efforts into that show, a lot of my galleries had to be very patient. And I said, I'm so sorry, be patient. And now I'm all sending them things, you know, and in that time frame, they could be like, Oh, we don't have space for you anymore. So you hope that like your galleries stick around for you. And if, if not, then, I mean, I should maybe one day should have my own website. I know that's smart to do, but I just don't have time to do that. That's a whole other thing. You don't want to get 
more busy than you want can be. Does that make sense? You know, you know what I mean, Brianne? <laughs> yeah. Oh, <I> know. <laughs> um, okay. Wait, we have a couple other questions. Uh, what type of ventilation do you use? Oh, it's a Hako. Um, a Hako? I actually bought on Amazon. It was cheaper than Rio. I just pulled off the little vent thing, but that's the brand. It's pretty darn good. And to be honest with you, it's a really worthy investment. If you don't have access to like a window, a window's okay. But, um, and also to surf, if you're familiar with surf, if you write a grant, sometimes they will, um, give a grant for studio safety. So that's an opportunity to look into if you're not familiar. And again, if I'm talking too quickly, DM me and I'll send you. No, and a lot of, I've, a lot of artists have gotten that um, ventilation specifically through that, through this. That company, yeah. It's, it, I, I want to say it was from $600, but it's probably money well spent. You know, we can take care of our bodies. Um, well, that's a good question. One of our co-presidents has, Sorry. has the uh, amazing question. <laughs> I love this. What is your snag story and why is snag important to support? Snag is so important to support. Honestly, I was like, I am honored to make snag a necklace to be so honest with you because snag has been so special to me. Like, I feel like I am like, I just feel like I'm at home at snag. And I remember going to my first snag conference when I was, it was, um, Seattle, I was in graduate school and I got into the student show, which I was so excited about because I made this weird necklace with bones with black butterflies all over it, like just strung some bones on silk. And that piece got into the show and I was so pumped and I got to go and it was just magical, right? You go to your first night conference is magical. You're like, wow, all these people like the same things as you do. And you, and I made these little cast bird feet. I like cast made a mold of a cardinal foot and I made these little pins and I'm pin swapping with all these people and I made all these friends during pin swap and I'm still friends with them now and you know it's just a place where you feel like these are your people is if you know no matter what type of people what type of metalsmith you are you can find your people at snag and for me I just sort of dove head first into snag culture like I was like I want to know everybody I want to know all the names I want to know what work they do I want to know what galleries they're at like I want to just I want to watch their YouTubes. I want to, you know, follow, you know, you do all the things and then you just become a super fan of all the culture of snag. And then, you know, I think what it's done for me is it's given me these connections, like these opportunities I have to, like I taught at Peter's Valley and taught at Haystack. Um, I did the teen class at Haystack. One day I want to do the grown up class at Haystack. Um, but, you know, these opportunities come from like the people you meet and the connections you make and those, those, the connections really, like we all know, like that's, that's how this all happens and how this organization stays strong as these people you meet and the people who want to make it better and make it stronger. So I'm um, snag is, you know, I joined the, um, Nash nominations election committee, NEC, and, um, that's been really fun to work with because I've made some new friends on that committee because I want to help in any way I can with snag. So, um, yeah, I can't wait for the next conference. I'm so sad I have to skip a year, but it's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, the conference is really like the highlight of my year, to be honest. So we have another question. Uh, I absolutely love your etchings and love the earrings you had at Snag in Providence. Would you ever make those jeweler tools etched earrings again? Uh, well, we have a secret that we can't yeah, release. You can tell Brianna. You have boss. You can tell the secret. No, no, I'm holding it. Okay, just yeah, stay we tuned. have a secret. So you all know that that yeah, there's stay something tuned, happening. Jennifer. It's literally there is something actually literally <laughs> on my desk, but <laughs> um Yes. Um, and I, anything here's the thing with the laser, right? This is the magic, right? I'm, I might arrange things and I never make the same thing twice. Typically, like it's always a combination of two things or I'll arrange, like, I just did this little hand pendant. Like I'll probably never do them like this again. Right. But in those snag tools, they're never going to be exactly like they do. They're all arrange them in a different way, but I can always remake something because the file exists. Right. So if you contact me in five years, like, Hey, Kelly, I want some uh, nerdy snag tools and a soft frame on a piece of black mother pearl, or I want on a piece of green onyx. Like I can do that for you. I can, you just contact me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, and stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, and stay tuned. Have you ever tried snag. any other forms of etching and how did it go if you did? Um, etching, oh, I'm going to guess you mean stuff? etching the stones. I've etched metal for sure. Definitely have etched some metal in many ways. 
I'm going to guess you mean etch on the stone. So I will say like, here's one of those bananas that I haven't cut out yet. I have all those things. So here's a banana. And sometimes the ant legs, you guys don't come out because the line's so fine. Can you see, is that coming in? Okay. And so I will take a scribe and I will scratch the legs out by hand. So sort of like more like a scrimshaw method where I will hand engrave or hand etch. And then I will have enough depth to inlay the ink into them. So I will do it by hand. I'm no means an engraver at all. So um, I want to the thing about being a teacher too, especially a beginner teacher. I feel like I know a little about a lot of stuff. If that makes sense. Like as an art teacher too, like as you, when I was at Syracuse, they made me take a class and everything. Like that's how I took my first metals class. Like take metals, take ceramics. You have a large breadth of knowledge. So that's how I feel as metal since I have a large breadth of knowledge, but I'm deep on a few things, but I can tell you a little bit about everything else, even though I want to know everything It's just, there's not enough brain space because metal smithing is too huge to be an expert in everything. Aren't you nervous that ink would stain the stone since you work experimentally? That's a good question. If I have a crappy piece of pearl and I inlay ink, like I bought some seconds of pearl because it was a really good rate and the ink just like bleeds way below the surface and it's really frustrating. So I have to buy the good quality, like grade double A pearl. Um, but all the other, the other things I can, I can see that I can literally see the depression, like of the etch, like it's like side view, like it's literally like a channel. Um, so no, I'm not too nervous about many of the things I'm more nervous about, like the green, so this is a piece of green onyx that's been giving me trouble. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes if I have the power too high, it cracks the stone. So if you look really closely, I've got some cracking happening. There's a secret and you just got to bezel that and hide that right away. Um, but uh, I just need to like, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like, there's not that nervousness of like when you've spent so much time on a piece, right? And then like, let's say you're sawing it and then the stone cracked and whatever, yeah. like you're from what I've heard from you, like so much of this is what's experimental is like, there's a lot of reject pieces. Oh yeah. yeah. You're, you're trying yes. to get all these, like the light, the, all the settings, right? So here's so, my good pile. Yes. Yeah, so and here's my reject pile. Look at this. This is a reject pile of things that I'm like, I cracked last minute. This one, like the hand just blew out. If that makes sense. Like it looks horrible. This is my just, you know, if rejects are definitely part of the storyline, but then sometimes there's beauty in the rejects too. So I try not to, you know, I always tell my high school students like metal smithing is a metaphor for life. Things are going to go badly. You need to take a deep breath and try a different avenue to do, because there's many ways to one outcome. It's just, you know, it's just that. Like, so I try to remember that, like, I get really nervous. I have some opal and people are like, oh, you're going to etch that opal. I'm like, oh my God, I don't think I can ever etch this opal. <laughs> so it's so soft. I know it would etch beautifully, but I feel like I'd pulverize it. And like I etched a ruby and it literally just blasted the surface. It was like a little, I could see it, the laser hitting it, no matter what setting I put the, the ruby, just like, pew, pew, like it was a bummer, but it was cheap ruby, you know, you maybe I wouldn't obviously put like an expensive stone in the laser, but, um, yeah, it's, Again, it was it's another question. <laughs> when you pierce out the I shell am... shape, like the banana, do you have to add water to get a cleaner cutting line? No, I don't. Um, it would be safer cause you're not making all that, um, dust. Um, but I just saw it out. Um, and I, and then I sand it and I get a pretty clean line. And actually I use like a pumice flex shaft tool and that gives like a really crisp, crisp edge to my mother pearl. I just got those. I had a tool, um, and Joanna Goldberg, I used to work at Peter's Valley and she taught a workshop and she gave me this one little flex shaft and I didn't know what it was. And then I, I wore it down and it's been very useful on what I'm working on now. And it's a pumice, right? Yeah. They're so amazing. good. Yeah. I know I need to try all the varieties now. I have the one with two colors and oh my gosh, so good. So um, other <laughs> questions, anybody? We just have a couple minutes. We're kind of coming up on the hour. Um, if other people want to like put your video on, say hi, feel free. And I, I'm going to turn my spot. I, I want to do this so that I need like the Instagram thing. I'll remove my spotlight. And then can you like show the necklace, like take it on or wear, wear it or whatever and show it and something that maybe we can use uh hold on hold on let me thank you all for your questions i really loved and appreciate them yeah awesome <laughs> cool
Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, any last words, Kelly, that you'd like to share before I stop recording? No, I mean, help snag out, buy some raffle tickets. If you don't win, or put I'll, that link in the, in the, uh, yeah, yeah. The if you don't win and you bought a ticket, DM me, I'll, I'll send you something. We'll, 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 I'll give you a lapis treat. <laughs> we'll make sure everyone gets some happy jewelry out of getting a raffle ticket. So yes, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate you spending Thursday night with me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop recording.